A cult is my passport, perhaps the coolest name for a movie I've ever heard. But does the movie live up to the name? The short answer? Hell yes. Cult is My Passport was directed by Takashi Nomura and stars that 60s gangster movie badass Joe the Ace Shishido. It almost slipped into relative obscurity until the Criterion Collection released it on DVD in 2009 for their Eclipse series number 17, Nakatsu Noir. It is also available to stream on Hulu Plus. A Cult is My Passport was released in Japan in 1967, which you may remember is the same year Shishido starred in Seijon Suzuki's Branded to Kill. Shishido was a busy man. He appeared in 170 films while under contract at Nikatsu, and yet, he counts A Cult is My Passport as his personal favorite. It is possible that he holds a special place for A Cult is My Passport because it was kind of his big break. In an interview with Mark Schilling, Shishido said, Before that one, I was just playing the bad guy to Kichiro Akagi and Akira Kobayashi. That film was a good break for me. I had a starring role fall into my hands. When I was making dirty work, I felt that my life as a star had begun. Then I got A Cult as My Passport and Slaughter Gun. Those were my big leading roles. If they'd let me have leading roles from the beginning, my career as a star would have been longer. But I've been in 300 movies, 170 for Nakatsu. I don't think anyone can beat me there. Shishido was even considered for a major role in the Hollywood film The Bad News Bears Go to Japan, but his English wasn't good enough. A Cult is My Passport director Takashi Nomura died last month of pneumonia at 89 years old. Aside from directing, he was also an actor and actually had a role in Suzuki's Branded to Kill, but his part isn't credited. He played a fairly large role in Shion Sono's 2001 horror film titled Suicide Club, and it was his first acting role after a 27-year hiatus. A Cult is My Passport was released several months before Branded to Kill, and there are a few notable similarities. For example, the assassination scene. Joe Shishido plays Yakuza hitman Shuji Kamamura, tasked with assassinating a rival boss, and in this scene, near the beginning of the film, he pays the owner of an apartment building to view a unit on the fourth floor that overlooks a tea house where his boss and the rival boss are scheduled to have a meeting. To watch the full assassination scene, click this button to open a new window. One can't help but notice how the scene parallels the sniper scene in Branded to Kill, where instead of a chirping bird distracting Shishido, it's a butterfly. The chirping bird adds a wonderful texture to the otherwise silent scene, which I believe is much more effective than if they used music. It gives us calm and suspense all at the same time. Even though this is a rather simple sequence, we get a wide variety of shots and cinematography techniques, including tilts, close-ups, frame within a frame, extreme long shots, extreme close-ups, point of view, zooms, and foreground elements. Shishido getting ready for the assassination is fascinating to watch because it's made up of unique concepts that pertain to an interesting line of work. Assembling a sniper rifle from pieces in a suitcase, checking the wind speed with a cigarette, and sitting on the suitcase are things that the average person has no knowledge of, but they are clever solutions to issues someone might face as a hitman for the Yakuza. Everything about Shishido and this assassination is clean, and its precision is mirrored in the precision of the cinematography, but also in the pristine apartment. If he had broken into a dirty, cluttered apartment instead, we might expect something would go wrong, but like this apartment, the kill is efficient and organized. Shishido's outfit remains neat, and he removes the shells from the scene and packs everything perfectly back up into his suitcase, but he notes in the car ride that as clean as he was, his bullets are still in the target's body. There are several features of Occult is My Passport that Suzuki applied to Branded to Kill, but none more obvious than this scene. While Occult is My Passport inspired a fair amount of Branded to Kill style, including Joe Shishido's deadpan hitman hero, Takashi Nomura's main inspiration for Occult is My Passport was in the cinema outside of Japan. These films were considered makokuseki, or borderless action films. Makokuseki means statelessness, and also refers to the racial ambiguity of some anime characters. But in this case, it refers to Japanese films that use elements, style, and content found in films from other cultures outside of Japan. They drew a great deal of inspiration from Western culture, mainly French and Hollywood films. And what was created was a brilliant hybrid of Eastern and Western style. Some Makokuseki films even went as far as featuring cowboys in contemporary Japan. With The Cult is My Passport, you can immediately see the similarities to the spaghetti western, and we hear them as well. The theme of the film is very Ennio Morricone-esque, but perhaps even more substantial are the similarities to the films of the French New Wave. It is obviously shot very economically, with most likely a very low budget. There's a fair amount of real locations and similar characters, as well as subversive shot choices. 
Even though a few Nakatsu directors like Suzuki and Nomura brought a unique voice to the table, Nakatsu was still a business and their business was to make entertaining and therefore profitable movies. Nakatsu modeled itself after Hollywood and we can see a nod to classic Hollywood in this scene where Shuji's sidekick Shun, played by Jerry Fujio, performs a song on an acoustic guitar. These films are a feast for the eyes and the ears. This sequence harkens back to western studio pictures featuring talented performers like Elvis and the Marx Brothers who would break in the middle of a story to share their musical abilities. This happened quite often in earlier Hollywood films, presumably because media wasn't so readily available and either the studio wanted the films to be packed with as much entertainment as possible or they wanted to showcase a talent that could be lucrative in other avenues. It is likely that Nakatsu noticed the success of this concept and adopted the practice themselves. Elvis's movies promoted his music and there could even be extra money brought in by releasing a soundtrack. This concept still pops up on occasion in contemporary films. Just look at this scene from The Punisher. And in time all things shall pass away in time You may come back someday Nearly all actors were under contract to one studio and would only appear in that studio's movies. Jerry Fujio was a bit of a rarity. He was a freelancer and actually played a small role in Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo, which was produced at Toho. Leading up to the final showdown, the rival gang kidnaps Shun and makes a deal with Shuji that they will let Shun go if he gives himself up. What is interesting is how they do the exchange. Shuji agrees to the deal and the rival gang just releases Shun. Shuji then calls the rival gang and tells them where to meet him for the final showdown. This seems strange because at this point, Shuji, Shun, and the tagalong Mina are safe and they have a boat. They could just leave the situation and everything would be fine. But Shuji upholds his side of the deal and meets with the rival gang completely outnumbered. This reminded me a lot of the end of Reservoir Dogs. Click this button to skip the spoiler if you have not seen Reservoir Dogs. At the end of Reservoir Dogs, Joe and Eddie are dead. Pink leaves and the cops are moments away from rescuing Orange. But Orange tells White the truth that he is an undercover cop. As a matter of fact, in Japan, they have a word, like, to describe it. Not only is there not an English language equivalent of the word, there's no adjectives in the English language that can uh, really do the word justice as far as describing it. The word is called jingi, J-I-N-G-I, jingi. The closest thing to jingi, as far as, like, trying to describe it in America, is honor and humanity. But that's a weak description of Jingy. Jingy is beyond honor. Jingy isn't beyond humanity, but it's beyond honor with a little bit of humanity in there. The best way to describe Jingy, and it's also often used in, in like, like Yakuza movies, it's the thing you must do, even if you don't want to. <laughs> Before the final showdown, the Yakuza bosses retrofit their car to be completely bulletproof so they can watch the showdown safely. Shuji sees this and builds a bomb in a captivating scene that features no music or dialogue. It is communicated entirely visually that the bomb is magnetic and has a five second timer on it. To watch the final showdown in its entirety, click this button. We get a callback as Shuji is distracted yet again, but this time by a fly. Whereas the butterfly motif is revisited and branded to kill as the object of Masako's obsession, in Occult is My Passport, it is revisited as a fly, free to flutter away from the dire situation that Shuji finds himself in. What makes this set piece work so well is that first, it pushes the tension to the breaking point. We've been waiting almost the whole movie for this moment. Second, Nomura incorporates every stylized cinematography technique you can think of, including pans, zooms, sideways tracking shots, and deep staging. And third, tension is maintained by integrating the bomb plot point into the first battle. The action rests and builds the tension yet again for the final climactic moment, and we get my favorite shot in the whole film. I mean, talk about a hero shot. The tension is somewhat alleviated as we go into the more playful music leading up to the final confrontation, as the men in the car play right into Shuji's plan. The aim for these movies is to be both exciting and fun. There is a time to subvert expectations, and there is a time to give the audience what they are begging for. And right now, we're begging to see these guys get blown to smithereens. The music choice plays into that nicely. We know what will happen. 
The editing in the climactic moment is made up of quick cuts and various shots that build the tension to the absolute peak, and then the pace slows down slightly for the climactic moment. What's really interesting is that the style of the editing in the climactic moment is very similar to the editing of the final moments of Bonnie and Clyde, which happened to come out seven months after Occult is My Passport. Bonnie and Clyde's editor, Dee Dee Allen, had mentioned that it was her assistant who did the rough cut for that scene, and she fixed it up. But we can see a similar action editing style in another of her films, Dog Day Afternoon. Nomura joined Nikatsu in 1955, and by 1969, Nomura left Makokuseki and started making what's known as Jitsuroku, or True Stories. By 1976, he faded into obscurity in the West. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my first patron, Carl Lohman. If you would also like to support this channel, click this button to check out my Patreon page. I'm working on implementing a poll to give you the opportunity to choose the subject of a What I Learned From Watching episode. Pledge any amount and you'll get the ability to suggest and vote. And if you're new here, please hit that subscribe button now because there are plenty more videos on the way for cinephiles like you. Thanks again for watching.